today. Matthew 22, verse 1. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, just short stories, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared, so he's telling you what heaven's going to be like, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves or his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the slaves or the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Now, verse 7, the end of verse 6, and and verse 7 We've pretty much discovered from our treatment of the text, scholars have anyway, that that was added by somebody else. You know, so when you read your Bibles, you always, always have to be careful to accurately study them and look at your commentaries. Verse 7 was not originally part of the parable that Jesus told. The king was enraged, as Matthew's text goes now. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Now this is where Jesus then continues. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is the word of the Lord to which we say, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Loving God, we're asking, gosh, you know, these parables, they do give you pause. And a lot of times, even today, all of us need help, me included, in understanding them. So we pray that you'll just sift through our thoughts now, help us to quiet our minds from this busy world that we live in, and just listen to your word and to let it wash over us. Help your Holy Spirit perhaps redirect some of our thinking and the way we treat people in light of this great parable. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start with a little bit maybe of a a personal nature today. I've done this before, um, and I've even talked about this subject matter a little bit with some of you. On Sunday afternoons or Tuesday evenings, I usually attend what they call is uh, an ACA meeting. That is uh, a famous letters that mean or stand for adult children of alcoholics. I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. Now, I've been open with you about my growing up days uh, in, in my family of origin. Okay? My, both my parents were alcoholics okay they died from it now I loved my parents and love my parents uh, very much but I didn't have a great home environment Um, surprisingly even earth shattering I don't know why but it is I've been amazed at how those early childhood experiences can play themselves out today as if they happened yesterday. They're as crystal clear uh, today as they have ever been. And being 57 years of age, I'm amazed at that. Okay. Now, if you've never been to an ACA meeting, let me just suffice it to say it's about 90 minutes in length. Much of the content is from a standardized page or two or three or four that's read at every meeting it doesn't change we talk about the problem we talk about the solution we talk about you know those 12 steps what differs at each meeting though is the sharing that takes place everybody who attends and it's usually between 8 and 15 people they get five minutes to share with no comment coming from anybody else, no crosstalk. And when it comes to your time to talk, I don't know how it happens, but it all seems to go back to one's growing up days. 
and the dysfunctionality that was found in the home at that time. Suffice it to say, the sharing is incredible. It would be almost impossible for me to reduce ACA meetings into some common traits that we all have, but there are some, okay? Um, And stay with me, because I'm going to relate this to the text in just a minute. But most children of alcoholics never really developed their sense of identity, who they are as a person. We were busy, busy parenting our parents. We're also very terrified of abandonment. We've, a lot of us have stuffed our feelings, have self-esteem issues, and have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. We will care for others at our own expense. Now, I get something out of every ACA meeting, but the last meeting has changed a lot about today for me. It caused me to switch what I was going to speak about. You see, last week, the meeting I attended, I lived out a parable, and I'd like to share with you today the parable. This is not the first time that things have changed on Sunday because of something that I experienced during the week. I'm always alert for what God is saying to me throughout the week. I'm quite sure, though, that this parable, if you allow it to, these words of Jesus, they can shift your perspective in a healthy way and align you more with the way God is and the way God operates. Of course, you don't have to do any of this stuff. I learned a little while back that you can't get an adult to do anything unless they want to do it parable of the wedding feast is what I bring before you today for you to consider. Now, every theologian, every writer I've come across says Matthew's description of what typically happened in response to weddings in the Middle East when he was alive is right spot on. This description of the things that took place with the king and his son is or was true in that day. Middle Eastern weddings are a little bit different from our weddings. Obvious is the fact that, you know, we don't sign agreements anymore from the standpoint if I have a daughter and she's going to get married, I'm not signing any documents to that effect. But in Jewish days, in days of Matthew, a betrothal, was something that took place when all the agreements were signed and everything was understood as taking place. Weddings were prearranged, and they were prearranged, generally speaking, for a young man and a young woman who was all of eighth grade level today in schools. Wedding days were announced. They were from five to seven days in length. They were generally held in the autumn when the harvest was in, the wine vats were full, people were at peace, there was plenty of food in the house, and the evenings were cool. The time of the party generally wasn't announced. You just knew what day it was going to begin. On the eve of the celebration, the party would begin when the groom and his attendants would arrive at 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 the... Fetch the betrothed from her father's house. The groom would be all dressed up. He'd be wearing a crown. And they'd snatch this gal. And off they would go. People would be singing in the streets. They would be usually echoing songs that were found in the Bible. The next day, just as the food had been prepared at the right time, the servants would be sent out into the community to say, come to the wedding. All of you are invited. Presents would be brought, and the bride would be there, the groom would be there, and all this party would begin. It was with that understanding now that Matthew tells this story of Jesus. Jesus talks about a king whose son is going to be married. 
And it is an invitation the king sends out to the whole community because the whole community is invited. Come to the party. This laughter, this festive occasion, this abundant food, this good fellowship is yours. Please come. But the parable turns dark in a few short verses when we learn that surprisingly, as the servants announce the wedding and the day of the wedding has come, that people are busy. They're busy with their businesses. They're busy with life. They're visiting with family and friends elsewhere. And they don't come to the party. The king is absolutely stunned by the news, and he says, oh, this, pos- this can't be true. And so he sends his servants out again with a little more news this time. The fatted calf has been prepared. The wine vats have been unsealed. The musicians are here. The food is ready. Come, please come to the party. The king announces it. But the people don't come. Most don't. And upon this second realization, now the king says to the servants, okay, if this is going to be the way it is, go out and find anybody you can. I want you to go to the non-Jews now, to the Gentiles of all people, to those sinners, to those doing those immoral bad things, and bring them into the party. And we'll we'll then have this great festive occasion. And the result is that every chair, every table for the wedding feast is full. Now, Jesus was telling this story to give you an idea of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. Now, research today says a lot of us think about heaven. Really, we wonder what it's going to be like. And I'm here today to say that this parable tells you a lot about it. There'll be an invitation for the whole world to come to a party. The whole world will be invited. It's not universalism. Everyone's invited. Doesn't mean everybody's saved, but everyone is invited. And there's two strange truths coming out from this whole thing as I thought about it a little bit this week. Not everybody will come to the party. And the people who arrive are not the ones that you would think would be at the party to begin with. Think about those two points for just a second. Not everyone will come. Isn't that odd? And they don't come because they're bad people. They they don't come because they're busy people. 2,000 years ago, and this, this passage from Scripture just sinks right into the heart of our busy world, doesn't it? It is so shocking that people won't come to the party because they're too busy. And you know, the Bible is full of similar stories like this. The entire book of Revelation tells the same story. God invites people over and over again to repent, to turn to God. God will break seals, blow trumpets, pour out bowls of wrath, send plagues, burn up a third of the earth, and surprisingly, people will say, no, I'm not going to repent, I'm not going to turn to you. They won't listen. Other parables, the parable of the ten virgins, they failed to prepare their lamp fully with oil. Instead, they said, let's go party instead. Let's go visit somebody. Let's go to Florida. I have family and friends down there. Let's talk to everybody for a while. We don't need to prepare now. And the Lord comes. Not everybody is ready. And they miss the party. Other biblical examples, the call of people to follow God. People give excuses. I can't come and follow you, Jesus. I have to bury my family member. I have to take care of my business. I have to pack my bags, and then I'll go and gladly follow you. God invites us to come to a feast 
now. The party's going to be grand. It's going to be joyous. But so many will miss out on the opportunity to go because they're not bad, they're too busy. They're enjoying life right now. There's places to go, people to see, and things to do. Strangely, the things that make us deaf to the invitation to Christ are not bad in and of themselves. Most of you, me included, are not on this wild carousel of immoral behavior. Like the people in the parable, we're about making a living. We're about helping others. We're about visiting children, going to see grandkids. But it is so easy to be busy with the things of this life that we fail to take into account the things of eternity. We hear so clearly the claims of this world that we can't hear this invitation for, from Christ. As Ken said, Christ has issued that invitation for you to come to a party. The tragedy is that many of us will miss out on the joy and it need not be the case. So please hear this call from God today, this invitation to come to the party. I think it's a, it's a plea to open your heart it's an invitation to give to God today. Jesus stands with his arms wide open saying, come to me. You can't say I might try it tomorrow because none of us are granted tomorrow. We only have today. Being busy is dangerous. But equally stunning in this all this parable as well. It's the people that you expect at the party aren't there. And certainly the people that are there, you'd say, oh, I don't know. And that, is, that was so clear for me this week. That was what was so amazing at the ACA stuff. The people that are there are a rough bunch of people. Good golly. You can imagine at the end of the meeting when we all gathered in a circle and say the Lord's Prayer and ask for God's help. As I looked around in the circle with me, these were people that life had discarded. I thought, rightly or wrongly, that these are the people that didn't get the first invitation. At least I wouldn't think so. Some of these people hadn't been divorced once. I've been divorced five times. Some of these gals hadn't been abused once by grandfather, father, or brother. They've been abused hundreds of times. There wasn't just a person with one addiction in the group. The whole group had addictions. Some had served jail time. Some were on parole. Some had ankle bracelets. It's one horrible story after another. These are people, though. And that's why I switched to the banquet story. These are the people that aren't too busy to come to the banquet. These are people that can't wait to get to the banquet. Life has been so hard and so harsh on them. And truth be told, I'm one of those people. Francis of Assisi found himself identifying, Francis of Assisi, with the least and the last and the lost. Because he found in them the irresistible presence of Jesus. If your heart has been broken, you suddenly find that you've got a lot of deep things in common with those whom you thought you were quite alienated from. I have something in common with ACA people, namely brokenness. What about you? Are you waiting for an invitation to the banquet, or are you just a little bit too busy these days? Thank you very much. It's an important decision, one that I wouldn't take lightly. Maybe there's some time in your future 
today for a conversation with God. And that might God have something to say about your priorities and how you look at people and how you treat people. The 1990, in 1990, the Boston Globe ran a fascinating story of something that actually took place in downtown Boston. I don't know if you heard about it. It's, 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 it's been mentioned a few times. The story goes like this. A, a gal and uh, her mate, well, they weren't, they were going to be married. They decided that they wanted to be married in downtown Boston at the Hyatt Hotel. They made elaborate plans for the reception. Both of them were, you know, kind of looking over the menu of food and it was quite elaborate. The type of china, silver or gold, types of flower arrangements, even the wedding announcements the hotel would do. They both had exquisite taste. And after leaving a substantial down payment for the festive occasion, the people went home to look through the wedding announcements. The day the wedding announcement was supposed to be sent out, though, the groom got cold feet. He said, I'm not so sure I want to do this. It's a big commitment, you know. Let's just wait a little while longer. Well, you can imagine how this was received. This angry fiancé, his anyway, returned to the Hyatt and said, listen, the engagement's off because of this guy. And the hotel, though, refused to give him the down payment which was $13,000. It seemed crazy, but the bride said, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, let me think about this. She had a crazy idea. True story now. She had, 10 years prior to the event, been homeless. She had lived in a shelter. Fortunately, she found a job, got back on her feet, but she always remembered where she'd come from. So in June of 1990, at the Hyatt Hotel in downtown Boston, there was a party. Invitations were sent to rescue missions and homeless shelters. And that night, instead of dumpster diving, the homeless dined on chicken cordon bleu. Hotel waiters served hors d'oeuvres to senior citizens with crutches and walkers. And addicts, right or wrong, sipped on champagne and ate chocolate wedding cake, dancing to the tunes of a big band that was present. What took place, according to the Boston Globe, was a glimpse of perhaps what the kingdom of heaven might look like. I agree. Jesus talked about it in the Bible. It was commonly referred to as the parable of the wedding feast. The good news that I share with you today is that everybody's invited to the party. Everybody should have a smile on your face. You've been invited. The problem today, though, is some of us are going to throw the invitation away because we've got too many things to do. If you're too busy today, to have a conversation with God about the invitation that God has given you, then maybe you're too busy. Maybe you and God need to talk about your priorities. You see, in the last analysis, I think God's invitation is, a God of, is an invitation of grace. Those gathered from highways and byways really have no claim to the king at all. None of us do. The invitation comes from none other than the wide-opened arms of Jesus Christ and the generous hospitality of the King. You see, it was grace which offered the invitation to you. And it was grace that gathered men and women together. I'm sure you've heard the story about a man who dies and goes to heaven St. Peter meets him, as always is the case, I guess, at the pearly gates and says, here's how it works. You need 100 points to make it into heaven. You tell me the good things you've done, and I'll give you a certain number of points, depending upon how good it was. You reach 100 points, you get in. Man says, okay. 
I was married to the same woman for 50 years, and I love her deeply. St. Peter says, that's wonderful. That's worth two points. Two points, the guy says. Well, I attended church my whole life in ministry. You know, I've tithed, I've served, I've been on the hospitality committee, congregational life, I've served on stewardship. St. Peter says, terrific. That's worth a point. One point? I started a soup kitchen in the, in the city where I worked, and I even worked at the homeless shelter. Fantastic, St. Peter said. That's two more points. Two points, the guy says. At this rate, the only way I'm going to get into heaven is by the grace of God. Bingo. <laughs> you can come in now. And God has given you an invitation to the party. Will you come? And will you come to the party today? Will you talk with me today about what we're going to do at the party? I invite you all to rise as you are able. Give us a minute to get plugged in here. <clears throat>